guest speaker here today again, good friend Jonathan Mall. Now, Jonathan's background is he's a cognitive neuropsychologist. That's what his PhD is in. And Jonathan is in very high demand from a lot of digital circuits. So I'm very appreciative of Jonathan's time here to share his insights on AI and marketing. Jonathan studies how people think and then creates words to make them click more in terms of AI copywriting. Because if you understand how people think, you can design better copy to make people click. So Jonathan essentially is in the business of turning trash copy into cash copy using insights from cognitive neuropsychology. I've been privy to Jonathan's work. I've, there's there's one project, in fact, that I'm working with Jonathan. I've been privy to Jonathan's NeuroFlash software, and I use Jonathan's software in some of my teaching classes as well, because with, with a lot of AI insights, sometimes the crossover into marketing is a bit obscure, but with Jonathan's work, you'll see the crossover and overlap and implications to marketing copy very, very clearly. So some really exciting case studies, really exciting examples that are going to come now from Jonathan. So Jonathan, on behalf of the University of Huddersfield and our business school, thank you so much <clears throat> for your time. You know, I'm going to hand yes. over the floor to you, Jonathan. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, it's a it's a great honor and privilege to be here as well, talking to you guys. So thanks for the invitation. Uh, indeed, my name is Jonathan Moore, and uh, I'm the CIO and co-founder of NeuroFlash. Background has already uh, been gracefully mentioned there. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about this, uh, why a billion brains are smarter. And in fact, why I founded this company and why I think this is so fascinating comes from something that I witnessed in the London Zoo. So I was there and I gave uh, a speech, like some talk, and the uh, we had some time to kind of walk around in the park. And all of a sudden, there was a huge siren sounding in the London Zoo. It was moving like, wee, wee, and it would say, all staff to Gorilla Kingdom, all staff to Gorilla Kingdom. And I was young <laughs> and uh, naive, saw a sign with the big gorilla on it. And I was like, right, you know, gonna, gonna walk right in there. So I went into the Gorilla Kingdom. I saw no apes, nothing, but I saw a bunch of zoo workers in green overalls, frantically running around. And I went there, tried to be a little bit funny. So I said, hey guys, uh, did the gorilla escape? Where is he? And uh, the guy turned to me, looked me straight in the eyes and said, very seriously, sir, we do not know where the gorilla is. Please leave and hide in one of the cages. All right, I haven't heard that sentence uh, in, a, in a zoo before. So we actually went to uh, one of the bird cages and uh, well, it was in here. You can see here my tweet, uh, gorilla on the loose, huddling in a building at the London Zoo after staff told us to get into a building quickly. Seconds after I posted this tweet, I got calls from radio stations, from TV stations wanting to interview me uh, because of that uh, escaped gorilla. And as you can see in the picture, we were looking for that uh, thing. You know, any shadow that you would see around was the gorilla. If the birds in the background were chirping, it was, you know, like a cat sensing the, um, uh, the earthquake. They could already see the gorilla. It was quite frightening. Helicopters circling the zoo, more and more uh, people running around uh, trying to find that gorilla. And in fact, this whole story in the, on the next day was all over the papers. So you can see here, catch King Kong, right? Notice the picture that they choose. Notice the how down there it says huge male with awesome power. Uh, I, unfortunately, of course, I think they mean the gorilla and not me. Um, but you can see how this story was very appealing. Very, very appealing. So appealing, in fact, that worldwide it made the news. Uh, in China, Switzerland, the US, Brazil, everywhere this picture was used, the story was printed about this uh, King Kong on the loose. I was even on the BBC live, very interesting. Uh, you can already see it a little bit in the face here of the reporter. 
because unfortunately she asked me like you know how was it you know were you afraid and i said well no because the people told us what had happened right after they thought the gorilla escaped because the actual story was that that gorilla went into a room where usually the meals were for him and uh, concentrated blueberry juice like six liters uh, drank it up and fell asleep that's where they found him they dragged him back into the cage and nobody was ever in danger but of course the story um, worked because it had all the right emotions had all the right associations a gorilla on the loose in a zoo that captures your attention that triggers you know everything even though the story wasn't quite there right it actually didn't happen and this is what fascinated me so much that i went into this field of finding the words that make people yeah that get them triggered to maybe print your story <laughs> in the newspapers um when you have something you know that actually happened of course but to make people triggered this is why i found a new flash so a couple of things to mention today one is going to be about attention why do we pay more attention uh, to a loose gorilla uh, in a zoo than maybe in high, on high street then what is this thing about associations these automatic thoughts that we have in our heads how do they lead to emotions and then in the end i think most relevant to you how can you use those insights to maybe write your own story in a more effective way, your own marketing story, your own brand story, or your personal brand story? So let's start with attention. I want to show you this little video here. This works. Yes, it does. So this is an experiment done with macaque monkeys. You can see I'm very much ape based in my <laughs> the, uh, communication here. So they are in captivity. And you can see in a second how this researcher is going to give them a rock. The goal is for them to give back the rock. That's the game, right? And then they get a cucumber. And they get cucumbers every day, totally normal. However, she also has some grapes. And I'm going to actually, I'm not sure whether I, I'm also sending the audio. So I'm just going to test it and you tell me whether you can hear the audio. Did you hear the audio? No. It's a no. Is there a setting for that? OK, then I'm going to see, are there subtitles? Yes, OK. All right, no worries. I love this next part. Nope. Not having it. All right, so what do we see here? We see very much how this macaque monkey is paying close attention to something that is kind of odd. She usually gets the cucumber, uh, but this time the other uh, ape got the grape, and that is really causing them to yeah, get, get the attention. So if you imagine any type of animal is very much attuned to what is normal in their environment. What are the sounds in the forest that a rabbit can hear? But if there's a sound that is unfamiliar or maybe associated with a predator, well, then the ears go up. And the same happens to us all the time. We always look for deviations and the deviations are actually what capture our attention. So that's why um, an escaped gorilla in a zoo is very much you know, surprising, because that's not what you would see. And imagine if that if you would see a gorilla running at you at High Street, you would actually most likely think that it's not a gorilla, but a man in a costume. And maybe only at the last minute would you see that you should run away, and maybe then it's already too late. Because the environment shapes your expectation, just like for the rabbit, uh, we have these expectations all the time. And if they're broken, 
that's when you pay attention. And of course, you can also use that to your own good. If you have a new product that you're selling and it's too new, like when the automobile came out and there were already horses doing the same job, a very smart engineer actually put a wooden horse in front of the automobile that didn't need that, but in order to trigger the association that people were used to, right? This thing is still going to carry you around so that you can understand what the purpose is of the machine. So deviate from the norm, you get attention, use a word in your copy that is very unfamiliar, you know, or uh, it's very uh, crass that you don't hear that often, then it will trigger some uh, attention. And if you use something that everybody would expect, maybe it's easier to process, but you will not uh, always get the attention uh, unless, of course, it is something that someone may be looking for at the moment. So that is attention, deviation from the norm. The second one, of course, is association. And this one is really interesting <laughs> because um, it comes back to what surprised me the most during my studies, where I was told, rightfully so, that the brain isn't there to think. Brooding about a problem isn't what the brain uh, is supposed to do. In fact, people who do that we usually call depressed because they brood about problems without doing anything. And you see this uh, in action, like here in the fitness studio, right? The easiest path is taking the escalator, even though the goal is to do fitness and probably take the stairs. And our brain wants to take the escalator all the time because, well, you don't want to burn energy needlessly. And let's look at these associations and how they may guide your own thinking. So in the US, what do you think is more likely to happen? That you get hit by lightning or that you get killed in one of the many uh, school or any other type of uh, kind of uh, out of the norm mass shootings. Type in your answer in the chat. Type either lightning or shooting. What is more likely? We see shooting, shooting, shooting. Lightning also, but I would say, based on my very accurate statistics, that there's gonna that there's more shooting out there. Well, the answer is it's actually ten times more likely um, to get hit by lightning. Oh, this is in German. It means ten times more likely. And obviously, your association to many of you told you otherwise. Why? Because I led with this image of the American flag. You thought about school shootings, other mass shootings that you may have heard of in the news, and that made it more easy to think about the shootings, and hence you overestimated the likelihood. Not to worry, this happens all the time. That's why more people are afraid of airplanes than they are of the taxi ride to the airplane, because one is more on the news if it goes wrong than the other. So what it is here to realize, though, is that this is happening all the time, that whatever our brain is subjected to, the words and the stories and the news is very much shaping the way that we think. The words that we read and write very much determine how we think. And what uh, some people have realized, and, and then after I read those smart people, what I have realized is that brains are mostly online nowadays. So people, when they look at their phones and they look at social media, all they see is words that change their perception. You know, you could maybe think of current conflicts uh, where seeing uh, the words from either of the two sides can uh, heavily influence how you see the situation. And in fact, we can uh, directly test that uh, to see how much the knowledge about text that is out there in the world determines the way that you think. So for this exercise, everybody, please close your eyes. So stay in front of your uh, computer, don't go to sleep, uh, but do close your eyes so that you cannot see. I now assume that all your eyes are closed. Keep them closed. And now everyone with an even age, please open your eyes and read these words. Silently, of course. If you have an even age, open your eyes and read these words. And close your eyes again. And now everyone with an uneven age, open your eyes and read these words silently. And close your eyes again. 
And now everyone, if you have an age, open your eyes and complete this word. All right, now that you have completed the word, the first word that you thought about, please type it into the text. But first, uh, into the, in the chat, first, the even people, even, wait, wait, the even age people, type in what you saw. I see soup, soup, soup. I see lots of soup. Okay, even age people soup, uh, stop. Now the uneven age people, what did you see? Now I see soap, uneven age people. There seems to be one. Oh, then there's more, good. Fantastic. So you can see, actually, it's pretty much 100% uh, from what I can see. And what happened was that I gave the even age people the words on the left, and you've seen that most of them, if not all, actually, thought of the word soup. And to the uneven age people, I gave the words on the right, and they completed the word with an A with soap. What you see here is the likelihood of the word soup being mentioned in the context of the words on the left. It's very high. And of course, the word soap mostly appears in the context of the words on the right. This has been gathered from words in the wild, so social media, mass media, etc. How likely is it that these words appear together? And this likelihood, as I just demonstrated, leads to your brain automatically going in that direction, automatically thinking of that concept, that word, because these other words have activated it. And that is an association, the link between words. And this is relevant for marketing because very often, if you sell a service or a product, of course you want people to think about something that, the, that makes the product good. Maybe it's sustainable, maybe it's very effective, maybe it's cheap or you know, cost effective or something. And to instill that association to your product, you wanna use copy that makes it very easy for people to make that connection. If you wanna sell soap, you will more likely use words because they make sense. And same with soup, the words on the left. And if it comes to positive attributes like trust, of course, there are other words that are more likely to make people think about that thing that you want people to think, like trust, and hence you should use those. That is the power of association, to make it very easy for the brain to think of what you want it to think. And you can actually see this uh, in action. So we have here two options. I could tell you that I have a bad day, or I could tell you that I have a hard day. Uh, both the word bad and hard uh, more or less uh, appear in the uh, English language uh, equally often, so they are very easy to understand. However, they cause a different amount of associations. So you tell me, which one of these two do you think uh, is more effective? Will have more people remember how my day was? Um, tell me which one is the more effective one, bad or hard? I can see all the time bad, and that is absolutely wrong. <laughs> so you, they, they've actually done the scans. So with a bad day, you can see here in green, uh, the areas activated, and it's only the ones that are responsible for understanding words. Whereas in red, you can see what is activated when people read the word hard. The reason behind this is that the associations are way richer with hard. Bad is a very abstract word, and yes, it will also be associated with other things like terrible or something, but the word hard is associated with, you know, solid, um, maybe like uh, gravel uh, or other things that, are, that, that themselves have quality that you can uh, picture and that just give you a, a richer um, impression about what it means if something is hard. If something is hard, it just means more than if something is bad. And that's where you can, for example, see uh, things here in the visual cortex because you can picture a solid object. Something has a quality if it is hard that gets automatically uh, activated. And again, that comes through the association of hard with those solid objects. Yes, so that was associations. We just talked about attention, deviate from the norm to get it. And we talked about associations, basically coming from what your brain is used to in the wild. You can predict what they will think next given a certain word. And now we get into emotions. Emotions means what people feel when they see a certain word. And uh, that is certainly always changing. So you can, of course, ask people, here's a word. What do you think about it? Uh, we do that, in fact, but we do this all online. 
and I'm going to use you as a guinea pig again to see which of these two words do you think is more exciting. Do type in the chat which one do you think is more exciting? Chili or white bread? Pretty straightforward. So in fact, correct, it is the chili. Let's try it again. Which one is more exciting, broccoli or spare ribs? Uh, it gets more difficult, but I see slightly more spare ribs, I'd say. That is correct, it's spare ribs. But which one is more positive slash happy, broccoli or spare ribs? I see broccoli, broccoli, ribs. <laughs> of course, again, this depends. Uh, man, woman, young, old, vegetarian, or being vegan like Fernando, thank you. Uh, so it is uh, overall, on average, broccoli. But here's the fun part. You can predict which uh, emotional rating a word would get, just the word it's uh, on its own, like unmistakable, the emotional meaning of that word, by looking at its association with other words. So if you know that the word broccoli usually appears in the same context as spinach and avocado, then by knowing from a survey that spinach is, for example, very positive, you can already predict that bro broccoli is likely also positive because it shares many associations with spinach. It is also a vegetable, it is green, uh, stuff like that. And you can see here in with these arrows, this is the association strength between two things, so broccoli and spinach, very close. And by simply knowing from a survey the ratings for spinach, you can then extrapolate and predict the ratings for all of these other words. Of course, you can see here the broccoli and the spare ribs uh, at either end. Uh, and what I find very interesting is that the meat substitute here uh, is not very exciting or calming, but it's definitely very happy. And you can also see in consumer behavior that they uh, are going more and more for meat substitutes, uh, myself included. Um, so that is emotions. And one way to accurately measure them for every word is to use surveys and then use machine learning to predict the emotions based on the associations. So very important here to note, there were three steps that I mentioned. Um, well, let's start from the beginning. We had attention, uh, deviation from the norm. Then we were talking about associations, but they came from words that a brain has seen in the wild. So all of the media, the propaganda, everything that has an effect on how easy it is for us to think of certain things. And then if you take certain words and you get actual ratings, for example, emotional ratings, you can again use the associations that you know to predict for other words uh, how their emotional perception would be. This is, of course, uh, what we do at NeuroFlash. Uh, and now it's about writing your story. So how can you use all of that understanding of attention, association, and emotion to create copy that works better for you? And actually, I'm going to start with an example that uh, I just tried right before uh, this presentation because I thought, like, uh, I was a student once. What would have really helped me as a student uh, when it came to automatic writing? Because as a student, I didn't quite write much marketing copy yet. What I rather did was actually, I would go to Wikipedia and I would get some paragraph uh, because to write about that in my own paper. But of course, I couldn't just copy the whole text, right? Because then the plagiarism alarm would go off and that's not good. So <laughs> what I can do now is I can copy this. I just copy it straight off Wikipedia and I go to NeuroFlash, the interface here, and I actually have created a, a prompt here, uh, what it's called. It's a freestyle text type where I just gave it the instruction, paraphrase of a definition. And then as a topic, I put in here the, the text that just came from Wikipedia. I can even change the tone maybe, but I just uh, click create because now it will paraphrase it. And I put down here, this is the original. This is the paraphrase. This is another paraphrase. And as you can see, um, it is similar. It captures the same meaning, but it's definitely uh, different. And I can even run it again to maybe get more variation. And as you can see, this would definitely uh, pass because what has happened here is that the AI has rewritten, has truly paraphrased the information um, and made it different. 
So that is fun. Uh, by the way, you can, of course, also do this for something more practical uh, when it came, comes to your own personal brand. This is something uh, that I have, for example, done just today. So I have today uh, posted this, this post here uh, about our recent funding round. But this text was actually written 70% by an AI because I used the original text that our CEO has formulated. I put it in here and I likewise simply rewrote it. And it then came up with a variant that has changed slightly. I put in some emoticons, for example, and then 70% of this post was done. And you can do the same with any other post. So uh, here is an example. Uh, I had this here. For example, here is some text about how important it is for a leader to make mistakes. I can likewise take this and say here, paraphrase into an engaging LinkedIn post, put it in, here's the original. This is the uh, paraphrase, and as you can see, it's absolutely different, but it makes the same point. So of course, I can reformat that and uh, uh, and, and write about this, this topic in this way. So this is all well and good. Uh, I think, you know, I, I hope you agree that this is something also useful uh, while being a student or by, you know, creating your own uh, brand uh, using content that definitely already works, but putting it into your own words. But there are many other text types that we have created with the knowledge, for example, of, um, uh, of marketing. So for example, we have here the uh, EDA framework where I can also put in some text and it would now create output following the uh, EDA framework. So uh, this is the attention, interest, desire, action very old school type of framework. And you can see that it will also create um, text following, following this logic. But what I so this is writing your own story because you can take in any type of input, uh, Wikipedia article, um, a LinkedIn post, you can even just have an idea, you know, uh, how important it is to use neural in your copywriting and create a post about that or uh, create any text uh, about this. There we go. Copywriting is an essential part of any marketing strategy. You can increase your results significantly and so on. And here he even tries to do like a, a call to action. We would be happy to discuss your specific needs, but I would change that maybe to Tell me how I can help you or get in touch or something like that. OK. So this is just the write your story. But of course, you also want to apply this attention, emotion things to this text. And for that, we just need to switch to another app. So I'm now copying this, what I would consider kind of the headline. Copywriting is an essential part of any marketing strategy. And I go to our AI tester. I'm going to call this writing importance. I'm going to choose here English UK. Any of these models, by the way, is based on the words in the wild from that country. So if you're marketing for someone in the United States, the associations will be different. You know, remember the mass shootings and uh, other things, good things also, freedom and uh, Big Macs. Uh, so those good associations would also be here in the United States model, but we can choose UK. Then what I would like to create is, uh, uh, actually I don't need to create anything. I can just go on and create and write your own. And I put down, uh, copywriting is an essential part of any marketing strategy. Here we go. It will now be rated. And just so that I have some variation, uh, I'm going to actually start over and I'm going to go for, is it a slogan? Mm, yeah, why not, why not use this as a slogan? And I'm actually going to use that uh, as an input. I can again put it up here. 
But you can see now that the AI, when it comes to a slogan, can create more variation. So uh, words that move mountains, the power of words, the one thing that you can't afford to overlook. Those are all powerful ways of saying copywriting is an essential part of your marketing strategy. I could even just click on this button here and say more of this. So it would, he would rewrite this. It's an essential of any successful marketing campaign. This is interesting uh, because, of course, um, you want it to be part of the successful marketing campaign. And indeed, this does better than the plain version. But now we, again, have just written something. What it now comes down to, of course, is to determine what is this rating. And this rating you define here in the goals is indeed, is it easy to understand? Does it trigger happy emotions? I could also make it more powerful. So these are the emotion predictors that I talked about. Remember the broccoli and the chili. So we can look for each word. Is it triggering happiness or power in the UK for a UK consumer? Will it be understood? So is it a word that appears often or not so much? And of course, next to the emotions and the understanding, we can also define things like, well, I want people to think of creativity because we want people to stay creative every day using Neuroflash. So then maybe creativity is key. And this, of course, would be an association. What should it imply? It will now come up with the results. And you can see it here. So I take away the easy. It's a little bit of trouble when they when it's too short, but you can see here how much the uh, each of these sentences is triggering positive emotion, powerfulness, and an association with creativity. And you can even go down to the individual ratings per the word. So power is great. I could replace this also with other ones. Uh, it has some loading on creativity, 18%. I could change it to superpower. Why not? See what happens then. I think it just got slightly better. It's more creative now, maybe because Marvel, you know, superhero, superpower, that is more from the creative realm. But to wrap up, you can write your own story with the AI writer, but the AI tester can help you to apply what I've just told you about, the ability to trigger the right associations and the right emotions. And when it comes to attention, that the brain, the, the human you are still needed, because of course, uh, what's the context where you're going to put this will determine how much attention people will uh, pay to it. But these other neuromarketing techniques of triggering the right emotions and the right associations, uh, you can now do. And everything here is obviously done by AI. By AI. I've shown you um, this creation and rewriting. This is done by one particular AI, it's a transformer model. And then the testing, this is done by our own proprietary uh, technology where we use the words in the wild to rate how likely it is that superpower and creativity are associated to rate it for the UK consumer. And we use the data from surveys to indicate how likely it is that a certain word uh, will cause happy emotions like the word successful. And that wraps up uh, the the learning part, so to say, uh, of this presentation. Of course, once applied uh, in the wild, you can see that uh, if you write your newsletters like this, you're gonna be more successful because you can optimize for emotions and uh, associations that carry your product's benefits. This works, works also for social posts and of course, website conversions, anywhere where copy is printed using the best words will get you more success. So we have talked about attention, associations, emotions, and how to write your own story. It all started with the gorilla, which was surprising to see on the loose, uh, or at least in the newspapers, it seemed to run wild with our associations. You have seen associations here with the soap and soup. Emotions were indicated with the meat substitute or broccoli. And when it comes to your storytelling, uh, you now have seen a software that can take a lot of the leg work, uh, and I hope uh, that you agree and that you now have uh, yeah, more questions for me. Um, I'm very curious to hear them. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hope uh, you learned something today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you so much. 
Dear audience, do we have questions for Jonathan? Um, we have got, I can't see who's raised there. Ah, Fernando, my friend, thanks for coming again, Fernando, to our talk. Fernando, please go ahead. You may need to unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me and see me? Hello, hi there. Hi, uh, Jonathan, thank you very much. It's been a very inspirational uh, talk, actually. Um, oh, uh, I'll give a bit of my background. So I'm a, uh, my background is design, uh, product design, and industrial design. Um, I am currently studying an artificial intelligence bootcamp here at the university. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I did that is because during lockdown, I got hacked. Um, Ouch. And then I became extremely apprehensive about being online. And then I started reading stories about, you know, how we are tracked. And then Facebook happened. And then, you know, I, I started to get very apprehensive. But I'm the sort of person that instead of, you know, getting overwhelmed by these things, I rather research and understand them. So one of the things that we've been looking at in, uh, in, my, in the artificial intelligence bootcamp is how to use artificial intelligence for the betterment of humanity hmm. i'm all up for Small that uh, so, well that that's that's basically the the, the 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 main that's what we're supposed to be doing right the problem that i have noticed as a designer and as a marketeer is that um most of the artificial intelligence initiatives have been used for profit which is not a bad thing but I would like to see more. For example, I just seen your your website, Neuroflash, is absolutely fantastic. And yes, I'm going to sign up for the for the trial. Um, but how? Uh, my, my question to you would be like: Are you inclined, or what sort of like um, work have you done in terms of facilitating your work in a free environment, sort of open source, so to speak? Um, because one of the things that we've noticed, or one of the things that I've noticed in my research, is that um, we would severe all companies would massively benefit from something like this to sort of integrate emotions with, for example, chatbots, because most of the chatbots that we have at the moment are are lacking that empathy, that sort of yeah. personal touch. And I think that that's the missing link between, you know, good artificial intelligence, uh, um, customer service directed uh, 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 tools as opposed to what we have at the moment. For sure. Yeah, so um, of course we are a company, we are a startup, we have investors and uh, investors like shareholder uh, value. So we are profit driven, obviously. Uh, that doesn't mean, however, that we don't try our best to uh, kind of focus ourselves also on areas that where the benefit is, is larger. So we have special pricing, for example, for NGOs, um, and we stay away from anything political. So political parties and stuff like that, they're not allowed to use our engine uh, because we just, you know, we don't want to take sides and you never know, you know, what, what parties turn into. But what we strongly believe, and I strongly believe, is that, uh, like, the good people are more. Like, I think that, you know, if you look, you know, this is very philosophically speaking, but with sufficient information, I think most people make the right decisions. So to give these tools at a, in a an affordable way to more people to make their voices heard about anything, you know, current events and non-withstanding, I think is a good thing. So, uh, and I think the barrier for entry is rather low mm -hmm. uh, if, if you if you check out what's, you know, what it takes. And in fact, the the ability to quickly react in an in passionate way, for example, to things that you see online and to to really get into a dialogue, those are all things that can be facilitated with software like this, to just enable more people to be part of the conversation. Because I think it's often driven by people who are very vocal or have fast fingers, but are not necessarily you know having the best uh, intentions or are narcissistic or whatever it is, right? Uh, the trolls and, and people like that. But uh, giving more people the ability to make their voices heard, I think, is definitely my goal. And uh, one of the ways that also Hasib, I think, got interested in our work was because we have been doing some work with UNICEF, where we analyze their social media to help them 
uh, better communicate uh, effectively, right? So, uh, and uh, spoiler alert, by the way, it was to talk more about hopeful things than about uh, dismal things that uh, was better to drive engagement and likely more better uh, better to uh, also get uh, funding and donations. Yeah, so that's that's how we're trying to do our part. But you know, in the end, uh, as I said, you know, the the, the bills Come need on. to be paid. <laughs> so exactly, that, that is. I agree. Uh, I mean, I'm not blaming yeah, you for so, that yeah. at all. At all. I mean, the bills have to be have to, have to get paid anyway. Um, um, and yes, I agree with you. Is 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 like, for example, one of the things that I'm proposing on my own uh, final project is that chatbots, instead of asking what can I help you with, say more like, how are you? You know, that's going to give us a completely different perspective of uh, of the human brain. And I have one last question. So in in the first uh, slide that you had, when you were talking about the word bad and hard, mm. and when you started talking about the uh, word association, um, and then you said that bad had, hard had a more a different connotation than bad. Um, I my I, I have a Spanish background, so I I speak Spanish and English. But to me, the word bad has a, a a worse connotation. That's because my brain is linked to the Spanish root. Do you think it also uh, uh, um, being bilingual or a polyglot has a diff, uh, uh, an impact on this uh, um, um, connotation as well? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so yeah. Right. And actually, you. Um, you know, uh, uh, I'm a psychologist by trade, and you can even give people personality tests. And if you give it to the same person in two different languages, they both speak. They turn out to have somewhat different personalities in each language. And actually, it's, it usually becomes a bit more stereotypical. So uh, a Mexican American give it in uh, uh, Spanish, I guess. Then, yeah, and uh, uh, in English, they will see more Mexican in the stereotypical way and more American, more ambitious, driven, etc. Uh, in the English version. So it's really fascinating. I think the way that you think and the language in which you think also changes who you are. So choose wisely uh, in which language you want to uh, fight with your wife or girlfriend. I know. Tell me about it. That's why I'm divorced. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> <You're most welcome. laughs> Fernando, thank you so much and thanks for coming to our talks. And Fernando is actually, hopefully, Fernando, you're going to be at one of our speakers, aren't you? So thank you so much. Hopefully, okay. yes, soon. Thank, thank you so much, thank my you friend. Much. Thank you. And Please. I just want to, I just want to add actually, Jonathan's work on not-for-profit um, social media usage and the framing of um, how charity framing can be done and its effect on engagement online is is actually one of the few that's actually available publicly and one of the best one of the best reads certainly one of the best reads that i've i've seen and that's that's actually how i got interested into neuroflash i got in touch with jonathan to to do a bit of work on that it's a fantastic read it's it's one of the one of the better reads that you will get right now is probably awesome. the best read that you will get um, on this topic, so I hope I hope we're gonna. Yeah, Joe. Joe is from the ambulance service, so we've got some charity fundraisers here, Joe. So it's it's probably one of the best reads. I use this as a case study in my classes and also for fundraising education as well. So um, any any more questions before I start the questions? There's a um, couple more in the chat. Yeah, Maybe we oh, can take them in order. That? Have I missed Have I missed those questions out? So the one is from Carl. Can you help with SEO practices? And the answer is yes. So the um, the word embedding models, the association models, they are obviously trained, or, or they will see what is most associated with something, what is occurring often. So by that nature, once you know what your topic is that you want to hit. Uh, be it sustainability, for example. Indeed, the words that it would rate highly are also the ones that are most relevant in that context. So naturally, uh, if you rate your title using that approach, you will get uh, keywords that are related and relevant for that topic. And there's also things that we currently work on to start the writing process with the correct set of keywords, you know, maybe showing gaps in the uh, in the search results and stuff like that. Uh, but that is still ongoing to to include more SEO practices. Right now, the benefit is you can write a blog article in basically ten to fifteen minutes uh, of of a you know nice length. And I can tell you, we have done it for our company, and we have seen um, like tremendous growth 
because we can basically write 300 blog articles a month uh, this way at very, very low cost. And, and I just want to say the talk, what you, what the insights Jonathan shared are actually tip of the iceberg on Neuroflash, Jonathan. There's a lot of stuff that, that can be done on Neuroflash. I've generated outputs on it myself with all the sentiment analysis. There's loads of loads of juicy stuff that can be done. Jonathan's just given us, in a way, a flavor into, into Neuroflash here. Um, Jonathan, just a few questions here. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but is GPT-3 the transformer you use? Yeah, it's one of them. So there's a couple of transformer models that, uh, as you know, uh, the the current best practice, the cream of the crop, when it, especially when it comes to sequence to sequence uh, tasks and giving input, and then you have longer output, like a blog article that is a sequence to sequence task. Um, it's one of them. Uh, there's a couple of other ones that we're using, especially ones that are already specializing on more European languages: uh, Italian, French, Spanish, uh, German, Dutch. Um, that uh, we'll be adding. Uh, so we have added them already in our development version. They'll be live by the end of the month. And we're also going to be able to create content in more languages, including French, wow. Italian, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, wow. I've got a question, if you don't mind me. Just sure, please. please. That's OK. Hi, uh, my name's Hi. Stephanie. Um, I'm an inclusive co-designer, and I work for the NHS um, within the digital health space. So we mm -hmm. support um, various different sort of stakeholders be it nhs um or be it just somebody who we've commissioned to do some work for us to um support them to ensure that their uh digital interventions are inclusive so we work i'm part of the health inequalities team and ensuring that you know people are not uh, negatively affected by the services moving into the online digital space now a lot of the um issues that we have is I mean it's really broad to be honest depending on the population group that we're working with but at the minute we're working alongside a gypsy room the gypsy Roma and traveler community it's just one of our projects mm -hmm. um who do have um you know they do have quite a barrier to when it comes to accessing information due to um sort of literacy levels and so on and so forth um so with this in mind, would there be a fit for Neuroflash when it comes to things like health inequalities and, and the digital sort of barriers that we face? I'm just trying to think how it would fit in because I love the idea of it. And if we could get engagement, ultimately, that's what we want. We want these communities to engage with us through our workshops to ensure that we can make our services more inclusive. Um, and sometimes that is the power of language, isn't it? In in, in how, you, how you say things and um, to ensure that people can kind of take what they need from that conversation yeah and um, but also for us to make our services more inclusive so i'm just interested to see i guess where 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 you'd fit in with the work that we're doing so um there's a function um that is, is called to summarize mm -hmm. it's basically this uh, too long didn't read so from my experience with uh you know the nhs or just medical services it's like you know read these two pages and there's like two points in there, right? Mm -hmm. That are just really, they're hidden. And you can upload that text and just tell me, you know, too long, didn't read. What's the what's the sum up? And mm -hmm. then just highlight that sum up throughout the text. You know, here's a bit of text, but what it, what we're saying is this. Here's a bit of text, this, but this is what we're saying in just really short, crisp sentences. And you can very quickly go through text that you have without you needing to read them. And it will show you, this is the gist of this. This is the gist of that. And you could, uh, I think, make it easier then for people uh, to, get, to get the main points very quickly. Okay. okay, that's helpful to know. Thank you. Appreciate that. Sure. And of course, you can always test everything, right? Every sentence for its ease of readability. Do I use words that are uncommon? Uh, you know, anyone who isn't a scholar uh, usually benefits from easier words. You know, mm -hmm. it's the Trump phenomenon, right? If you talk like a fourth grader, even fourth graders will understand you, even though they cannot vote for you. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's it sometimes. It's that medical terminology that um, can sometimes be a barrier for us in access, accessing, is in the people accessing our services. But then also that's what me, that's what makes our services, um, well, that's not what, me, that's what makes our, our services exclusive as well. You know, it's mm -hmm. being inclusive because we, we don't want to be a gatekeeper of an exclusive community. We want it to be inclusive. We want people to be able to dip in and out. And um, 
more often than not that's that's not the case sometimes a lot of the time we get it right but obviously since covid it's absolutely just excelled all of our uh, digital sort of realm at the minute so where so we've kind of been forced to go digital um but without the inclusion criteria there and set at the baseline so we're having to go back on ourselves and include that um, so there's some framework coming out soon that all services will have to be uh, inclusive and they all will have had to be have, have screened to ensure that you know we're tackling sort of health inequalities but I think it's the work that you're doing is really important because it's cutting out a lot of that middleman work so mm. we can actually really focus on the stuff that's important like like the health inequalities because I, that's my role and that's our world um, and yeah. not necessarily the digital side of it and obviously engagement and so on and so forth and I'm just thinking that that could be something that would be really helpful for us. So you've seen the, the LinkedIn post that I made, right? I the did. initial one, and I mean, no offense to my CEO, I would not dare, <laughs> but <laughs> it was very long and um, it was too long. So when I put it in and I said, rephrase it, the AI already did a great job of just removing sentences that were there like two or three times making the same point. Mm -hmm. And that's just unnecessary information that already makes it much easier to pass. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, when you were talking, you could, for example, take your existing social media channel and mm -hmm. just make a version that is underscore simple, take any post that you have, run through, and it'll just make one sentence out of it. And you'll just get the gist. Do you want to know more? Click here. But okay. you will be sure that whatever is posted is already the, the simplest way of saying something. Okay. Okay. That sounds brilliant. Thank you. It'd be sure. really good to touch base at some point, um, I think, yeah. just outside of this room. But yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. You mentioned COVID, Jonathan. You know what insights came from NeuroFlash during COVID? There must have been a lot of insights, maybe on. We're just working on a study uh, looking at pre and post Corona and the associations people have. And um, uh, my God, like just looking at which words are more and less mentioned, like taking a walk. Going for a walk, that is mentioned way more often, like big time. And then things like um, street parties, that is not mentioned at all anymore. Guess why? But we have some cool things there also having to do with family, for example, because it seems like during COVID people have had stronger bonds with their family. So we now see that even party and um, sports and those type of events are more associated with the family because it's, I would assume that more people would enjoy these activities and could only enjoy those activities uh, with family members. Mm -hmm. So everything that, you know, maybe you guys have also been walking more like I did, um, trying to do that every morning. And you can see that also in the data when it comes to associations, yeah. I hope you post something out, Jonathan. The stuff that I've seen up to now hasn't been really good. So hopefully something from, from NeuroFlash coming out would be very educational for especially- We're working on it. Pa inclusive pandemic marketing. Stephanie touches on a very important point, and actually, there's a question here. You know, I'm, I'm, should AI be used for academic writing, Jonathan? Do you want me? Shall I preempt the answer already, yeah, Jonathan? The, you, you can give your opinion, <laughs> but will it stop them? <laughs> <laughs> and in some ways, you know what Stephanie has asked, or what Fernando's asked, is, is, is something. It's a similar family of questions here because, I mean, I know you and I know NeuroFlash and I know you take a very responsible approach. You know, you've got limits as to public policymakers being allowed to use NeuroFlash, governments, political parties. You've got, you know, you limit access to the use of NeuroFlash. But, you know, in the UK, we had this case of Cambridge Analytica some mm -hmm. years ago, and this was a huge crisis here in the UK. And since then, though, within a few years, AI has mushroomed completely, completely mushroomed. And in some ways, the legislation is has so many loopholes, is so out of date, you know, um, to catch up with the times in terms, you know, what was permission based marketing, Jonathan, when I was a student is completely changed now, you know, is completely changed. Even GDPR rules, there's so many loopholes now with the pace that technology and AI has progressed. So, I mean, you've, you're a responsible marketer, but, you know, where do you see, in some ways, where do you see this going? You know, if um, the pace at which AI is going and this, on the same hand, the, the accessibility issue, the need for accessibility, is this something that, mm -hmm. you know, where do you, see, where do you see AI going? So some things I think are going to happen regardless of what I would say, right? Scammers going to scam. And they're just going to use new techniques. 
I just got like a robocall some some time ago, which was like the first time I got that in Germany. I heard about it in the US, but now they're coming over because the and it was actually really a robo voice, but now it can speak German. And this is obviously part of the, the advantages of AI. Um, I think in the end, you know, uh, people who want to do good, there's more of us. Um, there's obviously lots of guide uh, lines and guardrails to some extent already on some of these platforms. But also when it comes to just the generation, there are already some guardrails. So if anything, you know, like um, red light related, uh, for example, is being generated, it'll cut it out. It, it won't even be displayed. So that doesn't work. Wow. If anything comes out that is hate speech related, so it, yeah. it doesn't come out. So it will definitely uh, be able to give you a positive sounding marketing, uh, whatever, uh, or a blog article. But if you try to saw hate, it'll not generate some, something. And it'll flag it, and you know there are these these uh, guardrails. That's the cool thing about AI. The better it gets, the better it gets at checking itself, right? What do I let through? And uh, yeah, we try to to take the best care there, and by limiting access to parties who may not have the best interest, uh, or by not allowing certain types of output. Uh, yeah, those those are the limitations. But still, if you ask me, what will the future hold? It'll come. There will be bots that very sophisticatedly try to sell you Bitcoin <laughs> and NFTs. Yeah. You know, uh, they'll come. So, um, yeah, buyer be aware. But uh, I, I think that's just something that we cannot really prohibit e easily. Jonathan, thank you very much. And I'm just going to reiterate that within online donation at the moment there's actually nothing as good as um, i'm a fundraising educator and there's nothing as good as jonathan's free report there on unicef mm -hmm. and the way you could frame online donations and even imagery as well john it's quite complex is that that particular report and even different types of images so thank you very much jonathan i know we, we could stay here for another hour audience i know we could stay here for another hour and i know jonathan just 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 it's just been the tip of the iceberg here for there's a lot of stuff that jonathan hasn't gone into and um i really appreciate what you have gone through jonathan to give our audience a flavor as to you know how cutting edges is can i start online sh abdul malik has a question can i start online shopping website uk will the school allow they give 20 hour work practices on a website and a project with some company will sell product with I don't understand. Uh, is that, that that's a question for, for me, Jonathan? Is that I think if you're an international <laughs> marketing student, you get 20 hours uh, limit for for in a week to so that you it complies with the visa and the oh, border yeah. agency. Uh, so that, that was a question for me, Jonathan. That's come in the last question. Please feel free to, to message me separately, Abdul Malik. Okay. Um, I'm yeah, really same, same with me, by the way. So and same if... with Jonathan's going to share his LinkedIn profile, that's please. Right link up with Jonathan and I just want to apologize to the audience that you know we don't have more time with Jonathan you know because I know another hour with Jonathan would have been um, Jonathan I'm just really appreciating my friend that you gave uh, gave our students and our partners here um, your time thank you very yeah. much um, thank you so much you're most welcome uh, and, feel free and, to to check out the the application I posted the link earlier uh, I can do it again, maybe this free one. Yes, here. Uh, it's free for a week. And uh, if you want to get in touch, if you have more questions, feel free to connect on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing from you. And thanks for your um, for your feedback and questions. Very interesting. On behalf of our University of Huddersfield, Jonathan, a huge thank you. On behalf of our audience as well, a huge thank you. And thank you so much, audience. We've got our student society there. Thank you so much that I've co-organized this on behalf of our student society, our marketing student society. There are more. We we are going to arrange more speaker sessions and more master classes. We've got the head of communications for the homeless charity shelter um, at the end of the month. So the digital acquisition manager for shelter coming up. So please stay tuned. It's lovely to see our students there. And we have our Associate Dean Eleanor there as well. Very nice to see you, Eleanor. Thank you so much. Brilliant presentation. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And uh, con I just want to congratulate the, student, the Marketing Society for all their work and bring this together. I, this, this is um, well done, everybody. It's a 
what a coup. <laughs> thank you so much, Jonathan, for your time. Thank you yeah, so thank much, you. Eleanor. Thanks to the Marketing Society. Jonathan, thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Um, thank you everyone so much. Please stay tuned to the next masterclass in marketing. Jonathan, as ever, thank you very much, friend. Okay. Thanks, guys. Take care. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.